today, February 3rd, or actually this weekend, February 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in the cycle of the year, we're halfway between this point and this point. We're kind of right about here. This is known as a cross-quarter day. So you can quarter the cycle of the year according to solstice and equinox, but then you can cross-quarter it by dividing each season in half. And it's not just an arbitrary division. There's a term that takes place in the season at that point. So at the moment of cross-quarter day in the winter months, what happens is we are now closer to the season of spring than we are to the onset of the winter. And the uh, kind of the legends that go on around this in the United States, we call it Groundhog's Day. And it seems a contradiction. If the groundhog comes out and sees a shadow on that day, then that means we'll have longer winter. When I was a kid, I could never understand that. Why, if he's seeing the sun, that must mean that the sun is coming back sooner. But the idea is, well, on, on Candlemas Day is another way it's referred to. On, candle, if, if, uh, on Candlemas Day, there's cloud and rain, and winter is gone and won't come again. But on Candlemas Day, if it's clear and bright, then winter will take another flight. So if it's clear on that day, and it wasn't when I woke up yesterday morning, <laughs> then that means that winter will leave sooner. If it's, if it's, if it's cloudy, we, we will have a shortened winter. Spring will come sooner. So what's happening in that? <coughs> what's happening right now at this time of the year for us? Can we find this <coughs> in our environment? Is this a truth or is this just an old wives' tale? From the perspective of spiritual science, what's happening is that there is this cycle of the year. There's a relationship between the earth and the sun throughout the year, and that although we can't see what's happening below the snow and below the surface of the earth right now, it's very busy, and something is taking place. Rudolf Steiner refers to this very specifically in a conversation that he had in Koberwitz during the time when the agricultural course was delivered, and in answer to a question about what is it that takes place at this point in the cycle of the year, his response is that all of the growth forces for the coming cycle have finally arrived. That's a big idea. What does that mean? Where do these growth forces come from? So in my journey <coughs> to try to understand that, and I am not a farmer, but I want to know what that means, is that in the cycle of the year, as the earth is having this relationship with the sun, the sun is coming up to solstice, it's coming back to equinox, coming down to winter solstice, What's happening in this breathing process is that the human being is also engaged in that breathing process. We breathe about 18 times a minute on average. So if there's 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in a day, that means that on average the human being breathes about 25,920 times in one 24-hour cycle. If you're measuring the sun, and it's coming back to its starting point year after year, and you see that it's getting to the point of vernal equinox slightly earlier every year. It's actually about a 72nd of a degree earlier each year, and if you do the math and figure that out, then it takes about 25,920 years for the sun to process all the way through the zodiac. So in our breathing, we are immersed right in the center of this much larger rhythm. So it's, we're talking about years when it comes to the sun, but for ourselves, we're talking about minutes and hours and days. But there's this synchronicity in that rhythm. So our breathing, earth breathing, it takes us you know, less than a minute, but it takes the earth a whole year to do this whole gesture of this breath. So if I imagine myself living in that breathing cycle and in that breathing process, and I'm breathing in and breathing out, breathing in and breathing out, and the earth is doing the same thing. And if I'm journeying with the earth in that process, then I can begin to develop this picture that when, I'm, when the earth is breathing out and everything is reaching up toward the earth, then so as human being am I, living more into the, the cosmic space and the cosmic distances. Shakespeare referred to this as the time of year of the midsummer night's dream. I'm kind of dreaming out there in the starry world. And then when the in-breath begins, <clears throat> it's not that I'm just leaving that environment and breathing in, but that if I have had this summer dream, I can bring some of that cosmic substance back with me to the earth. And when I come all the way to the in-breath, what I'm bringing in with me is this cosmic substance that then I offer to the earth. This is the winter solstice moment of bringing something into the earth, and then the earth 
needs to respond to that. It doesn't happen at the exact moment of solstice, but you see this in the <laughs> images and the glyphs that were created to represent <clears throat> the constellations of the zodiac. You see this relationship between the cycle of the year and the earth and, and what's happening. So if, the, if I'm bringing cosmic substance back to the earth at winter solstice, then the earth is going to receive that and begin to respond. At this time of year, in a traditional tropical zodiac, we say that the sun is in a sign of Aquarius. Aquarius is usually drawn with a, a jagged line that looks like a wave. You could imagine it, that this is the period of time when the earth starts to respond to what has been offered to it. What the human being is bringing in, in thought life, in dream, in practical activity during the day, informing the earth about what is it to be a human being living in this larger cosmic environment that includes the earth. <clears throat> so if I hold this imagination or this idea that I've breathed out into the cosmos with the earth in the summer months at summer solstice, and then I conceive of something, I conceive of a star, I bring it with me back to the earth and offer <laughs> it to earth at winter solstice, right now at this cross quarter time, the earth begins to respond. So in my understanding and trying to work with what Rudolf Steiner suggests about growth forces that are present in the earth at this time, I'm related to what that is. It might seem like an abstraction, but it has to do with our thoughts and our feelings and our relationships with one another, our practical activity, our observation of the world that we inhabit, and how it's related to the starry kingdom. Then the earth, in its response, is it, it's something that informs us that then we offer to the cosmos when the cycle begins again and we're back breathing out into summer solstice. So this is an ongoing process, in and out. When I breathe in, I breathe oxygen in and I breathe out carbon dioxide. <laughs> so it's not just these chemical substances that I'm breathing in and out. As a spiritual scientist, you could say there's this spiritual substance, a spiritual essence that I'm breathing in and out. The earth is not just a physical body beneath my feet, it's a living spiritual being. And I'm mediating for it, with it, between this ground beneath my feet and the stars overhead. And so there's this process of taking earth gesture out into the cosmos, bringing cosmic gesture back to the earth, year after year after year. So that's kind of a fundamental idea of the picture within which I do my work. I'm going to hope that the next slide corresponds to where I just went. So this is a really, this was me with a smartphone laying out these images of the zodiac on the floor and taking a picture of it. Now these are not the traditional images that we have associated with the glyphs of the traditional zodiac. But in the year 1912-1913, Rudolf Steiner introduced a calendar called the Calendar of the Soul. Now this calendar was made up of images that were created by an artist by the name of Ima von Eckerdstein. Rudolf Steiner had given her the task of meditating on the rising sun each day and to take into herself uh, an awareness of what was it that was streaming from the sun and if over these, this, the, the zodiac behind the sun, so here we are on the earth, if we look toward the sun, then the stars of the constellations of the zodiac are on the other side of it, and what he said to her, in a certain way, is that there are forces streaming toward the earth from the zodiac. And you are to immerse yourself in the inner picture that awakens in you when you contemplate what's streaming from the zodiac over the sun toward you on the earth each day throughout the cycle of the year. And then create the image out of that. That's what these images are. They're called the new images of the zodiac. And I have actual, I have them here. I apologize that my picture is not that great. I'm not a photographer. But I have these cards, and so I can hand them around. This is the image for Aquarius, and actually you can hand that around. But so what the, the, so the point was that once uh, Ima von Eckerdstein had created these images, then Rudolf Steiner joined together with them these meditative verses. There are 52 verses that were to be contemplated throughout the cycle of the year. But this calendar was unusual in that it doesn't start on January 1st, and it's not a fixed number of days. It starts with the festival of Easter each year. Easter 
is a, an event that is determined in our calendar by understanding the relationship between the Earth and the Sun and the Moon relative to this celestial equator. Easter is the first sun day after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So, if this is the celestial equator and vernal equinox is the sun coming to this point, Easter is not the next Sunday. The moon has to come full before I can then find that first Sunday because there's a changing relationship between sun and moon that takes place at that time. So the sun is starting to move through the northern celestial hemisphere at vernal equinox. When the moon is full, it's always on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. So if the sun is in the northern celestial hemisphere, every full moon will be in the southern celestial hemisphere. If the sun is moving through the southern celestial hemisphere, then every full moon will be in the northern celestial hemisphere. From autumn equinox in September until spring equinox in March, every full moon is in the northern celestial hemisphere. We have greater moonlight than we have sunlight during that period of time. But then, at vernal equinox, when the sun moves into the northern celestial hemisphere, the sunlight takes over that moonlight. So there's this shift that happens. And the first sun day is the day following that first full moon that's below the celestial equator. This is a very important mystery. This is a cosmic thing that actually takes place every year. Whether you observe the festival of Easter or not, this is a a celestial gesture that's taking place between sun and moon. It kind of switch places and sun becomes dominant. It's a resurrection of life forces at that time. It's celebrated in a lot of different cultures that way. So what Rudolf Steiner did with the calendar of the soul is say, all right, we're going to start these meditative verses on that day because what this intends, this calendar, is to help the human being have a relationship with this cycle of the year, that the cycle of the year is a being in and of itself. And each year has a mood. And in order to inform ourselves or make ourselves uh, have the capacity to understand that mood, then here are these verses, here are these images. We can make use of these things to support that understanding. There are 52 verses, but if you look at a calendar and measure from Easter to Easter, there are never 52 weeks <coughs> because it's a changing relationship between sun and moon. And sometimes, like this year, Easter is in March, and sometimes it's really late in April. It changes from one year to the next. So in introducing this calendar, Rudolf Steiner explained that there was the possibility of ridicule outside of the anthroposophical community because this calendar would have to be adjusted every single year. And throughout the course of the year, even though I've given you these 52 verses, you're going to have to make adjustments in the cycle of the year. Where is it longer or shorter? Because we might end up with 58 weeks, or you might only end up with 50 weeks. So somewhere you've got to take out a couple of the verses or extend a couple of the verses to really get into this full breadth of the cycle of the year. This is kind of a conundrum. And what typically happens is you end up with a calendar in this form where you've got the verses with the dates that were given in the original calendar. The images are not included in here because these are kind of hard to penetrate and understand what they mean. So this kind of hovers there as something that we can use. It's a very useful source in Sherry's calendar. She lists what verses go with, which, with each month but it's a living relationship that you have to have. How many of you are familiar with the calendar of the soul? How do you reconcile this difference each year? Do you just kind of leave it alone? Which is what, yeah, what I've done for a long time. And they go, wait a minute. The whole point of this was to awaken the capacity to say, okay, here's what's happening in the cycle of the year. I can find that. I can figure that out, and if I don't, then I'm not really making use of what this is. The intention for this calendar was that it be reproduced every year, and it wasn't. This, these images were hard to understand. How do, you adjust, you know, how do we find ourselves in motion always? Rudolf Steiner said, in something that's fixed, you have the forces of death. 
This intends to support life. So the, I'm, I'm 